Let's talk about MTHFR and what that might have to do with you. Hello, if you are new to my channel, my name is Christina. I'm a naturopath, herbalist and life coach, uh, as well as a carnivore myself. And so this is a space where I talk about carnivore health and all things related to that. Now, one of the questions that I get asked on a regular basis, especially as a naturopath, is questions around MTHFR. Now, if you're listening to this and you're going, what the heck, did she say swear word? Well, we sometimes refer to the MTHFR gene mutation as the mother effer gene mutation, simply because it can mess with a whole bunch of different things. And that can be problematic for those that actually have it. Now, at some of the most recent studies have, have suggested that um, the prevalence of the MTHFR mutation is anywhere between 30 to 60% of the population have this mutation. And I would say that I see it on a much, like I see it on a really regular basis with the people that I'm working with. Now, remember that I generally work with people who are unwell. I'm not working with people who are healthy. Like, you know, occasionally I'll have somebody who's healthy and they'll come in and they'll go, I just want to improve or make sure that I'm optimizing what I'm currently doing to look after myself. Uh, but that's not the vast majority of the people that I see in my clinic. The vast majority of the people that I see are people who have already got some type of illness or some type of condition or they're in a, um, they've got something going on for them and they're not quite getting answers from doctors and they want to have a look at, you know, whether there's an alternative theory or thought around this, this whatever is happening for them. And so those are the people that I'm seeing. So when it comes to like that bias, I just want to put that out there that I don't see a lot of healthy people to compare it to other healthy people. I'm generally seeing people who are unwell and uh, a lot of those people will have something like the MTHFR gene mutation or a variation of it. Now, if you know that you've got MTHFR, you'll know that there are two main genes that we actually look at. Now, my, a lot of people think that there are only two genes, but there actually is something like 30 of those. And we haven't yet studied all of them to capacity yet to get to the point where we can actually talk about each of those things as consistently or as predominantly as we do the two major ones that we're currently looking at. And so if, you're, if you've been tested and you know that you've got it, you'll know that there's also variations on each of those two types of genes as well. There is what we would call homozygous, which means same, same, or heterozygous, which means different. So there's a different gene, uh, different a different genome. So the letters and the numbers are, are different or they're the same. Uh, and that will give us a different variation of the actual mutation itself. But to put it really simply, if you're listening at home, our genes are the things that actually, they're kind of like the blueprint in the sense that they tell the cells what to actually make and what to actually produce. So the MTHFR gene actually creates an enzyme and that enzyme actually breaks down folate, which is a man-made synthetic version of B vitamins. And that folate has been put into a whole bunch of different things. So if you go to the normal chemist and you go and get a B vitamin, you're likely to get one that's got folate in it. You'll see if you go to the supermarkets, there's going to be food that's called that's labeled fortified. Um, that fortified means that they've added stuff to it. They've added vitamins and minerals to it. And the likelihood is that they've added folate to it. Now here in Australia, in my country, um, there was some research done that uh, folate or uh, that actual B vitamin that, that folate is um, could prevent spina bifida. And so our government made a decision to mass medicate the population with this B vitamin. And so what they did was they put it into our bread supply. So they made a law that if you are making bread or if you've got flour that could be used for making bread, that it has to be fortified with folate. And if you're one of those people who have this mutation, then your ability to make the gene or the enzyme, sorry, your gene that makes that enzyme, that breaks that down, is compromised. It doesn't necessarily work as well. The function of it is not as great, etc., etc. So for example, for some people, they're gonna you know, make 70% of that versus 100%. Uh, or their, their enzyme is going to be effective at, at 70% rate versus 100% rate. 
uh, for other people it's only 30 percent uh, and so that's quite significant when a lot of the food that they're actually going to be eating has got this fortification in it or this folate in it and folate is a growth uh, nutrient so it actually really supports growth which is why it's beneficial for preventing things like spina bifida is it actually prevent like it actually um produces growth and so if you don't have enough growth um, nutrients then you're not going to be able to grow the way that you need to grow and so from that perspective what I want to say is that for a lot of people with this mutation what they actually have is chronic and significant B vitamin shortages now it's not the only thing that actually takes place as a whole myriad of things that actually take place but it is generally it comes back to that they've got a B vitamin shortage but the key is it's not a folate shortage it's a folinic acid shortage or deficiency and folinic acid is the natural form of folate folate is what we make in a lab it's synthetic humans make it but folinic acid is what animals make and what sometimes plants make as well and so if you've got a deficiency in this you're going to have a whole range of different uh, health conditions and they spread across all types of parts of your body so from example from the brain you're more likely to have autism um, ADHD ADD etc um, a lot of those alphabet disorders dyslexia etc they they tend to fall into that space anxiety and depression if you if you're a major sufferer from anxiety and depression you likely may have the MTHFR mutation which generally you're going to be deficient in B vitamins which means your liver is not detoxifying as well as it should other functions in your body are not able to repair and heal as quickly as they should and you're going to have some um, limitations in the sense of your brain might, might not be working as well as it could because you're missing out on what we would call as methyl donors. Now I'm, I'm throwing a whole bunch of big words at you. Don't get stressed and, and worry about this at this point in time. Like just get yourself used to the language. And at some point you might want to do some more in-depth study and you could do that with me. I've got a course that's called Do It Like an MTHFR uh, simply because if everybody lived like somebody who's got MTHFR, they really wouldn't have any any problem there's no major downside from assuming that you have it but if you have it and you don't look after your body like somebody who should if they've got it then you are going to fall into some of these problems so from a brain space we're going to have some issues there from a heart space we can have some issues with with mthfr as well because we're not making or we're over making homocysteine and the balance there is is out um, we're going to have issues from liver detoxification purposes, which means we will often have female reproductive issues from that, that perspective as well. People who have um, reoccurring miscarriages, they often have the MTHFR gene mutation as well. And so there's a whole myriad of issues that actually come with MTHFR. Things like autoimmune disease, you're more likely to have it if you've got, you're more likely to get an autoimmune disease if you've got MTHFR. Not that everybody who has an autoimmune disease will get it. Um, Down syndrome, um, people will have MTHFR. If you've ever had a cleft palate and had surgery for that, if you've got a high roof in the, like the roof of your mouth is really high, uh, if you've got a, a mouth that's cr overcrowded, so you've got more teeth than there's space for, or the jaw itself is not actually able to square itself out. Like those are all little signs that you might have the MTHFR mutation. And so for me, one of the questions that I get is what should we do? How should we live when it comes to MTHFR? And when I think about MTHFR, I think about people who have a limited ability to detoxify and also have a reduced function if they're not feeding themselves effectively and they're not creating a lifestyle that supports it that have reduced methyl donors so a little quick science thing is if you've got MTHFR you might already know about the circle um, or the cycle that is created but if you don't basically we have homocysteine homocysteine connects with some with our B vitamins like folinic acid and then together they make methionine and then methionine goes on to make SAMe. Now SAMe is our major methyl donor in our body, which basically means it pays for functions to happen in your body. It donates energy for things to happen in your body. So for example, your immune system is going to require methyls to actually run around and do the things that it actually needs to do. 
So if you've got less of these methyls because you have less B vitamins, because you've got empty HFR, then you're going to have an immune system that's under functioning. The same with a liver that's under detoxifying. And there's all these sorts of issues that can come from this, this perspective. Now, for me, when I think about people with MTHFR, I think about them from a slightly different perspective in the sense that I don't see them as broken. I see them as high performance machines. They are high performance machines. They are the Mercedes of the people world. They're the Porsches of the people world. And if you went and bought a Porsche or a Mercedes, you don't then go to the petrol station and buy the cheapest petrol to put in it. You buy the premium petrol. You don't go and buy the cheapest oil to put in it. You buy the premium oil because those engines have, you want to, you spend a lot of money on them. You want to look after them. You want to make sure they last the test of time. And people who are in that category, they have what I call a crap tolerance uh, system. We all have a level of crap tolerance. Some people can tolerate a whole bunch more crap in their life. And people with MTHFR just can't. They just can't tolerate a whole heap of crap in their food, they can't tolerate it in their environment, and they can't tolerate it in their lifestyle and their relationships. And so they're more sensitive to things like toxins, they're more sensitive to EMFs, they're more sensitive to food um, issues, etc. And so when I'm thinking about how to help support somebody who's living with MTHFR, that's a mutation that they've got, and they're living and they're wanting to live a vibrant life, then first of all, we need to start looking at some things like what's your homocysteine like so that we can start to look at whether you're over or under methylating and start to correct that and rebalance that. But ultimately, I'm really looking for creating a life that actually supports those mutations. And for somebody who's got MTHFR, this is where I think about carnivore on the spectrum, right? Somebody who's got MTHFR but has no real major health issues. To stay in that place where they've got no real major health issues, I think that dietary wise, they probably need to stay around that hypercarnivore space, which is around 70 to 80% um, meat and animal products, and then another 20 to 30% of plants with maybe a small amount of grains that don't have um, fortification added to them. So they're organic, for example, or their specialty like rye, spelt, iron corn, etc. But a very small amount of that in their diet versus versus their fruits and fruit type vegetables. That, that would be like the ideal diet for somebody with MTHFR, but no real health issues. And that will help to keep them in that space of no real health, health issues then the more health issues they have, the more they need to move along the spectrum of, of that carnivore diet where we're reducing the plants and we're increasing and amplifying the animal products. Now, the reason that I say that is that all animal products have a huge range of B vitamins. So the B vitamins tends to be the thing that tends to be lacking in those with MTHFR. And so if you are deficient in something, in order to catch you up to what is called maintenance level, we actually have to have to overeat that thing to get to the place where we're actually on a, on a level fo footing. And so for somebody who's chronically sick, they might need to move into standard carnivore, strict carnivore, lion's diet, where they're just eating ruminant animals like lamb, cow, um, goat, for example, things that have got more than one stomach, uh, and salt and water. And then as they start to get better and they start to fill up their cups with their B vitamins and rebalance their homocysteine, et cetera, and their detoxification ability, they can start to perhaps look at moving back towards that, that spectrum, towards that hypercarnivore space. Now, that's all gonna depend on things like whether they've got addictions like me to carbohydrates, or if they have had their chronic illness for a really long length of time, um, how long they've had it, how old they are, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna, gonna depend on those things as to whether they can move back to that hyper carnivore space or whether they need to stay more strict when it comes to that, that carnivore space. But really for me, when it comes to carnivore and MTHFR, I think it's the best diet that somebody with that mutation could actually be on, simply because we're amplifying the, the nutrient density that they're actually getting. So we're amplifying the nutrients that they're bringing in, including those B vitamins, and we're dramatically decreasing the toxins that they're exposed to. Because remember when, M when somebody has MTHFR and you've got a reduction of B vitamins, your liver function is not as high as it could be. It's not as optimal as it could be. And so we need to decrease the amount of toxins that are in their environment, and that includes their food as well. So we're decreasing the plant toxins, for example, 
and we're amplifying the nutrient dense food that they're actually bringing in. And so for me, that's, that's the best space for those people with MTHFR to hang out because it's going to feed them in a way that actually nourishes their body, but also doesn't tax it as much as well. So there's my little, little video on MTHFR. I've got a whole course on MTHFR. You're welcome to come and join me in that course. I'll do another live round of that this year. Um, but at the moment it's in self-study pace. So you can actually go through it on your own, um, at your own time and your own pace. Uh, and then you'll be able to join the live round when I do another live round. Um, but there, this is just a little scratching of the surface. And if you want to get testing, I can do testing. Other practitioners can do testing, depending on which state, country you're actually in. Uh, it's not that hard to get testing, but it actually is really worthwhile uh, in, in understanding some of what's actually going on for you when it comes to your own health. All right, that's it for me today. I hope you have the most amazing day. If there's anything you'd like me to do a video on, drop it into the comments. Remember to like and subscribe, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye for now. See you later.